It's called The Guard at the Bintui Bridge. How still he stands as mists begin to move, as morning curling billows creep across his concrete sentry perched mid-bridge over mid-muddy river. He stares at bush-green banks that bristle, rifles, mortars, men perhaps. No convoy shake the timbers, no sound, but water slapping both sides, bank sides, pilings. He slung his carbine barrel down to keep the boring dry, and two banana clips instead of one are taped to make now 40 rounds instead of 20. Droplets bead from stock to sight. They bulb, then strike his boot. He scrapes his heel and sees no box bombs floating towards his bridge. Anchored in red morning mist, a narrow junk rocks its weight. A woman kneels on deck, staring at lapping water, wets her face. Idly the thick rock bintui slides by. He aims at her, then drops his aim idly. Title poem of words from my daughter. About eight of us were nailing up forts in the Mulberry Grove behind Red's house when his mother started screeching and all of us froze except Red's. Fourteen, huge as a hippo, who sprang out of the tree so fast the branch nearly bobbed me off. So fast he hit the ground running, hammer in hand, and seconds after he got in the house we heard thumps like someone beating a tire off a rim. His dad's howls, the screen door banging open, saw Red's barreling out through the tall weeds toward the highway. The father stumbling after his fat son, who never looked back across the thick swale of Teasel and black-eyed Susans until it was safe to yell fuck you at the skinny drunk stamping around barefoot and holding his ribs. Another time, the Connolly kid came home to find his alcoholic mother getting raped by the milkman. Bobby broke a milk bottle and jabbed the guy humping on his mom. I think it really happened because none of us would loosely mention that wraith of a woman who slippered about her house and never talked to anyone, not even her children. Once a girl ran past my porch with a dart in her back, her eyes, excuse me, her open mouth pumping like a guppy's, her eyes wild. Later that summer, maybe the next, the kids hung her brother from an oak. Before they hoisted him, yowling and heavy on the clothesline, they made him claw the creek bank and eat worms. I don't know why his neck didn't snap. Red's had another nickname you couldn't say or he'd beat you up, Honey Bun. His dad called him that when Red's was little. So these were my playmates. I love them still for their justice and valor and desperate loves twisted in shapes of hammer and shard. I want you to know about their pain. I want you to know about their pain and about the pain they could loose on others. If you're reading this, I hope you will think, well, my dad had it rough as a kid, so what? If you're reading this, you can read the news, and you know that children suffer worse. Worse for me is a cloud of memories still drifting off the South China Sea, like the nine-year-old boy, naked and lacerated, thrashing in his pee on a steel operating table and yelling, dow, dow, while I, trying to translate in the mayhem for Tet of Tet, for surgeons who didn't know who this boy was or what happened to him kept asking, where, where's the pain, until the surgeon said, forget it, his ears are blown. I remember your first Halloween when I held you on my chest and rocked you so small your toes didn't touch my lap as I smelled your fragrant peony head and cried because I was so happy and because I heard in no metaphorical way the awful chorus of Soir Anaset's orphans writhing in their cribs. Then the doorbell rang, and a tiny green beret was saying trick or treat, and I thought, uh-oh, but remembered it was Halloween and where I was. I smiled at the evil midget, his map light and night paint, his toy knife for slitting throat said, how you doing, soldier, and still holding you asleep in my arms gave him a Mars bar 
To his father, waiting outside in fatigues, I hissed, you shit, and saw us in a child, in a pose I know too well. I want you to know the worst and be free from it. I want you to know the worst and still find good. Day by day, as, we, as you play nearby or laugh with the ladies at People's Bank, as we go around town and I find myself beaming like a fool, I suspect I'm here less for your protection than you are here for mine, as if you were sent to call me back into our helpless tribe. <clears throat> For the missing in action. I mean, you all know that. Is this mic any good at all? I, yes. You can hear it. You all know that there's something like 40 discrepancy cases, and that probably most of our missing are dead. But this is a matter of concern for us to find those dead people and bring them home and in some way resolve the pain of families that have lost loved ones in Vietnam. The Vietnamese have something like 250,000, they estimate because they have no records, 250,000 missing in action. And uh, this poem was set in Vietnam at a place actually Bill Earhart and I were at on a trip to Vietnam in 1985. I think it was. And uh, we were at a village that the Khmer Rouge had crossed the Vietnamese border and had massacred a village. And this poem comes out of that visit. For the missing in action, hazed with heat and harvest dust, the air swam with flying husks as men whacked rice sheaves into bins. And all across the sun-struck fields, Red flags hung from bamboo poles. Beyond the last tree line on the horizon, beyond the coconut palms and eucalyptus, out in the moon zone puckered by bombs, the dead earth where no one ventures, the boys found it. Foolish boys riding buffaloes in crater lands where at night bombs thump and ghosts howl, a green patch on the raw earth. And now they've led the farmers here, the kerchief women in baggy pants, the men with sickles and flails, children herding ducks with switches, all staring from a crater berm, silent. In that dead place, the weeds had formed a man, where someone died and fertilized the earth with flesh and blood, with tears, with longing for loved ones. No scrap remained. Not even a buckle survived the monsoons, just a green creature, a viney man, supine, with posies for eyes, butterflies for buttons, a lily for a tongue. Now, when huddled asleep together, the farmers hear a rustly footfall as the leaf man rises and stumbles to them. New poem called Collateral Damage. appropriate for the current events, who knows. Uh, it's actually a new poem built on an old poem. And the, if you see it on the page, you can see that the old poem is there in quotes. Um, and that poem was called For Miss Tin in Hue. And it was essentially a letter to a Vietnamese woman, a college student that took me and an American girl to her home where her father, who had been a Mandarin in the last imperial court, was judging the poems written in Chinese that the people of the city of Hue uh, entered in a contest, an annual contest, on the death of Fan Boy Chao, great intellectual and patriot. Uh, the girl, captured later freed, and I, collapsed by a snip of lead, remember well the tea, the tea you steeped for us in the garden as music played and the moon plied the harvest dusk. You read the poem on a Chinese vase that stood outside your father's room, where he dozed in a Mandarin dream of King Yalom's reposing at Ben Nu. We worry that you all are safe. A house with pillars carved in poems is floored with green rice fields and roofed by all the heavens of this world. 
Well, that was the poem written in foolish discovery and iambics by a 24-year-old feeling lucky not long after those scary events. Three years later, he, i.e. yours truly, went back with his young American wife, not the girl above captured freed, etc., and the night before the 72 spring offensive, which you will recall almost took the city, tried to find Miss Tin's house once again. In a thunderstorm, both wearing ponchos, and he, a version of me, clutching a 45 Colt while she just clutched his wet hand. Of course, anyone might have shot us. The Viet Cong infiltrating the city, the last Marines, the jittery Arvin troops, or really any wretch just trying to feed his family. So here's the point. Why would anyone, especially A, me, or B, my wife, or versions of same, even dream of going out like that? Simple. A, to show his bride a household built on poems. B, to follow love on all his lunkhead ventures. Anyway, when we found the gated compound, we scared the wits out of the Vietnamese inside. On the veranda, reading by tiny kerosene lamps or snoozing in hammocks under mosquito netting who took us for assassins or ghosts until my wife pulled off her poncho hood, revealing the completely unexpected, a pretty, blonde white devil. Since Miss Tin wasn't there, they did the right thing and denied knowing her. As night and the river hissed with rain and a lone goose honked forlornly. The next night we headed out again, the monsoon flooding the darkened city, the offensive booming in nearby hills and mountain yards trekking into Hue in single file as their jungle hamlets fell to the barrage. I kept our jeep running as my wife dashed out to give our piastres away to the poor bastards half naked in the driving rain. She gave it all away, six months salary, a sack of banknotes watermarked with dragons, except what we needed to get back to Saigon, but that's another story. The point here being, I often think of Miss Tin's pillared house in Hue in those events now 20 years ago, whenever leaders cheer the New World Order, or generals regret collateral damage. In one last poem. It's called Viewing the New World Order. And it has a quote from uh, Plutarch on the Acropolis where the poem was set. Plutarch well, he said it Latin, this is English, so he didn't really say this, but this is my version. <laughs> Each structure in its beauty was even then and at once antique, but in the freshness of its vigor, even today, recent and newly wrought. In old town Athens of date palms, of fern balconies, cascading canary calls, I walk with a Bulgarian friend up the stony sunshine path to the high city, where tangles of cactus and Spanish sword pock the Periclean ramparts and packs of wild cats prowl the brush for mice as the wind whips the naps of their fur and Georgi's little son, Eleko, hoots after them as we trail behind, plodding upward through the gate of broken columns to the precincts of Athena. Two poets from west and east here for the first time, awed by the lonely grace of stones fallen stones still standing. On the left, the smiling maidens of the carotid porch whose marble robes flutter in blue sky. On the right, the massive surge of Parthenon columns capped by a parade of centaurs, horsemen, gods, reliving dramas of who we are, who we might become, as pediments mark our battles with beasts, our talks with gods, our search for ourselves in philosopher groves of the city on the hill, that draws us by surviving. Persian navies, Roman consuls, Pasha's yoke, and Panzer Grupa, holding up like a Phidian model a sense of the examined life that is worth living, a place where gods and men could struggle with success, striving to widen the wealth of the human soul, the size of heaven. All across the monumental rubble, trailing after tour guides, Japanese photograph this field of broken stone. This is the New World Order my president would praise, 
both superpowers more or less broke. The Japanese are bankers. Looking east from the Acropolis, past Yugoslavian slaughter, the Kushlid we reactors about to blow. Further on in Tbilisi, the shootout at Parliament, the bread lines in Moscow, the dead rivers and lakes, the black colonels hopping in rumple stillskin rage at loss of empire, as Chechens, Kurds, Azeris et al. go for their guns to settle old scores. This is the realm of Israeli rubber bullet and Arab stone, of holiday shoppers at Clapham Junction bombed by Irish Santas, German skinheads bashing Vietnamese and Turks, of bloated African bellies, of fly-infested eyes, of shining path Maoists beheading Indians in Ayacucho, as Nosferatu warlords in Beijing sip their elixir of cinnabar and blood, and pop hot vacations in Thailand. It's snowing in Chicago, snowing on the cardboard huts of homeless in the land of the free as more banks fail and repossessed Midwestern farms lie fallow to the wind. When the wall fell to hurrahs of freed multitudes, one could hear communist gasps and capitalist sighs rise up in global shout which circled the earth for a year, then disappeared through holes in the ozone layer. The new world order. The tribes of the book are still turned to wrath as the worst of us would wind time back to savage past, easier to imagine. The philosopher's grove is empty. The poet's words gone flat. Against this aren't the Japanese, baptized in nuclear fire, clapping their hands for the kami of the cash register, our safest, sanest neighbors. These old stones cry out for more. Surviving centuries, sculpted here for all to see. The handsome youth, the maiden at the well, their inward smiles declare our need for beauty and laws like love. For this tiny polis of a planet spinning wildly, for my daughter snug, now asleep in her bed, for Aleko who played in the Chernobyl cloud, whose father now stands near their Nikes rotting freeze, looking out upon the city jammed with cars. Georgi opens his flask of vodka and pours some on a stone before we drink our toast to the new world order, to cedars shrill with locusts in the heat of summer, to whatever muse shall come to give us words. Thanks.